मज्ञानति निरंधस्य ज्ञानांजन शलाकाया चक्षुरु मिलितम येना तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः I'm extremely sorry for the delay. Somehow, at this time itself, my internet went off, so I had to do some other arrangement. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today, and so today we are continuing our discussion on the Parshuram pastime. Now, if we consider the Bhagavatam traditionally, it does not have chapter divisions. Hmm? It was a, it is a continuous narration, just like the Bhagavad Gita itself does not have chapter divisions. It is not, Krishna didn't say, "Oh, now I have completed chapter one. I am going to speak chapter two. No, Krishna just continues speaking in a smooth flow, and then it is the it is when the book is put in written form by Vyasa Dev. At that time, the divisions in terms of chapters are done. So similarly over here, let's look at the verse we are discussing. So, the, so the point I was making here is. one chapter of the parashuram past time ends and the next chapter begins so generally speaking the chapters are divided broadly speaking according to th uh, themes so one past time ends the next past time begins the chapter um, ends over there the transition happens but we will see sometimes two two broad themes are there in one chapter and sometimes one theme one past time may stretch over various chapters so how is the chapter transition done it is sometimes done based on the mood the mood means what is the emphasis what is the overall tone what is the overall message of a particular chapter so the previous chapter ends on the note of parshuram committing uh, parshuram being told to perform atonement and then This was this chapter begins. Let me see if my verses. This is visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sixth verse now, which we are discussing. So this is eight point sixteen point six. The first five verses don't have any purports. So Ramaha Sanchodita Pitra, Bhatrun Mata Matra Sahavadit, Prabhavagyo Munay Samyak Samades Tapashischa Saha. so what happened over here he comes back after performing atonement and then he finds that there's a drastic incident that happens in their life his mother is suspected of improper behavior and uh, mm, uh, it's interesting that parashuram's father parashuram is known as the angry person and his father has just uh, given a discourse on forgiveness but he feels so angry with his wife that he wants her to be punished to death and when her is parashuram the other's brothers refuse then he turns to parashuram and ramah sanchoditah pitrah so pitra means father sanchodita means impelled inspired instructed when ram was instructed this way what did he do bhratrun matra sahavadit so along with his mother and his brother saha avadit together he killed all of them now why would first of all a brother want to kill his own family this can seem ghastly prabhav agnyo munhe samyag but he did this because he knew prabhav he knew the influence the potency the power of the muni of his father samyag he knew what extraordinary power he had samadhes tapasascha sah samadhes he knew that he had attained samadhi he had performed austerity he had done meditation and therefore he had power so the overall theme over here is that so let's put it this way knowing the power of his son father he killed him so i like yesterday i will go ahead with the theme of using this as a white board so yesterday i talked about the context and we'll come back to this again how the context is critical over here mm, now here if this is taken out of context a brother mm, killing the entire family at the instruction of the father and that too for a minor offense it is not even a it was not even that his wife was 
actually i had done a physical infidelity it was just a mental lapse so it can the whole thing can seem outrageous so brother killing entire family at the instruction of the father so now some people say what kind of barbaric uh, society is this where something like this is being done mm. so the key principle over here is key, key word over here to understand is is prabhavagya you know this kind of without the context this kind of statement may remind us of some brutal systems of killing for crimes where say even in the in the in the west also in europe adultery was led to the punishment of stoning to death or sometimes putting on the cru crucifixion or on the stake and being burned alive for various sins so is this something similar not at all actually the point here is prabhavagya means the head he knew his father's prowess and here through this past time actually parshuram's presence of mind is being illustrated see sometimes whenever a particular virtue or a particular characteristic is illustrated we need to focus on what is the point being conveyed over there and not look at everything else so for example so when a particular sorry when a particular point is being conveyed so here parshuram's presence of mind or is in you may sometimes say thinking on the feet now in the midst of a crisis is displayed through this past time so he knew that his father is so angry he couldn't pacify his father so he decided to go ahead with it and if he obeyed his father his father would be pleased and the father would ask for a benediction and what would he do he would ask him to revive his family and to wipe out their memory of he having killed them in fact he wipe out their memory of even his father having asked that they all be killed so the point is that if we just if we take oh, you know how could somebody do like this okay that's a valid question to ask but then you also see prabhavagya the power some people say no 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 that that part of the story is just mythological if a person has been killed you can't be revived that just that is just fantastic that is just imagination well we cannot have half and logic like that if we are going to take a story take the full story full story means that prabhupada would say half and logic means we take one part of the story to talk about brutality but the other part of this miracle that doesn't work no take the story in whole the story in whole what does it mean that means that parshuram expertly managed his father's uh, fury so now is it that he has just given a discourse on forgiveness and now he's so unforgiving he's so harsh so what is going on over here there are many ways to understand this the key principle over here is that the bhagavatam doesn't shy away from showing imperfections in its characters now sometimes you may give uh transcend say for example parikshit maharaj himself there is a lapse on his side so the point over here is that some people may say that it's all transcendental it is a lord's arrangement that is of course true but parishit maharaj himself doesn't think like that he thinks okay i have done something wrong and let the consequences for that come upon me so the parishit maharaj is you know what happens is if we make everything as transcendental as the plan of the lord then what happens is there's nothing to learn there's no ethical lessons to be drawn there is no wisdom to be learned so each past time has a particular thrust a particular purpose so so sometimes when the virtues of one character are to be highlighted the bhagavatam often shows other characters in a relatively uncharitable light it can, they can seem to be shown in an uh, relatively uncharitable light but the point is we can't use those statement those actions to judge those characters let's take an exa few examples to illustrate this point say for example if we consider prahlad story now in prahlad prahlad mara story in the 7th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam it is described that everybody across the universe in they were bowing down to hiranyakashipu and even narad muni who is prahlad's guru who instructed prahlad maharaj in his womb 
नारद मुनि बॉ डाउन टू टू हिरण्य कशिप नाउ वी मे मंडर हाउ इज दिस पॉसिबल नाउ वी कैन से देवताज आर अटैच एंड देवताज आर फियरफुल they don't want to lose their life so they are attached that's understandable but narad muni is not attached narad muni can inspire detachment in people then in fact he inspires transformation and devotion and detachment in so many people across the world so why did narad muni do this so the principle over here is that this whole narrative the purpose of this narrative is to glorify prahlad maharaj and in one narrative when one particular character is being glorified all other characters we can say act or are depicted accordingly so when so this is generally the way in which shastra teaches so for example there is the story of uh, of lord ram is building a bridge mm -hmm. lord ram, ram is building a bridge bridge to lanka and while he is building a bridge to lanka what happens is that there are giant monkeys who are giant monkeys are carrying huge boulder boulders and then there is this tiny squirrel who is carrying some little bit a uh, some little uh, some little uh dust particle you could say some small species of soil and then it is described the uh, squirrel carrying she carrying a little dust and hanuman it is said he sees the squirrel and says don't come in the way you are just coming in our way hmm. so at that time lord ram says that i am taking i take both of your services very i value both of your services because both are serving according to his capacity now there is a vibrant tradition of hanuman bhakti in india hanuman is not never usually not worshiped as god even as a ram bhakta so there are many hanuman bhaktas who feel indignant at having hanuman depicted in this way they say hanuman won't devalue the squirrel service so they take the same story and they say it is not hanuman it was other monkeys hanuman bhaktas they say that hanuman won't behave like this so is this a diva hanuman they they defend hanuman they say this is depicting hanuman in a uncharitable light that's not the point over here say hanuman and they re replace um replace the monkeys or replace hanuman with other monkeys now i appreciate the devotional sentiment and since this particular story doesn't come directly in the valmiki ramayana so i also when i tell the story i don't use hanuman i talk with many devotees who are expert in the ramayana and they say that you know there's no clear scriptural source for hanuman doing this so but the point is even if it were true the point here is not to devalue hanuman the point here is to appreciate the lord's equal vision so every time in scripture when a story is being told we have to see what is the point of that story so the point uh, so i'll give one more example before we move ahead over here but there's such a important point that if you read gopal champu gopal champu is a book by jeev goswami um, who is one of our prominent acharyas champu is basically like a for a, a expert combination of poetry and prose that genre of literature is called champu so it describes krishna's past times but all of krishna's past times are described from the perspective of the rajwasis in this book so what does this mean that means when krishna is away from vrindavan at that time how the rajwasis are longing for krishna and how krishna is longing for the rajwasis and how krishna wants to go back to vrindavan can disallow him it is it is depicted as if the yadus yadu yeah, means the people of mathura and uh, dwarka yadu yeah, stop krishna from going to vrindavan and if we read only gopal champu it may seem as if the yadus are like villains the yadus don't don't seem to understand how much krishna loves rajwasis how painful it is for krishna to be away from vrindavan and yet 
that's what is depicted so is it that the yadus are bad people obviously not yadus are exalted devotees dwarka is also an abode in abode of the spiritual world part of the spiritual world so the depicted to highlight the yadus are depicted negatively to highlight special flavor of braja prema the the love that krishna and his devotees have the for so yadus are depicted negatively so i won't go into all the negative depictions but my point is that when a particular narrative is going on we don't have to focus on uh, the incidental aspects of the actions of other characters so even if we for argument say that okay jamadagni was a short tempered person and he got angry with his wife uh, because of her small indiscretion okay but is this one incident to be used as a parameter for his character throughout his life no this this incident the bhagavatam includes this incident primarily for the purpose of highlighting parshuram's presence of mind that so now and this is very important to understand how parshuram's presence of mind is important that so he is not simply hot headed he yes he, he his father gets angry and he pacifies his father's anger and that is so important to understand so prabhav agnya so you know so if we consider who is powerful hmm? not that you can say not just one who has great power definitely but also one who can channel or utilize those who have great power so in this case he knows his father has great power prabhav agnya so what parshuram does is parshuram himself is powerful he is able to fight and defeat and destroy powerful kshatriyas who have conquered the world but he is also able to pacify his father so he is expert he is not just a short tempered person going on a rampage when his father is angry he pacifies his father so who is powerful yes parshuram is powerful in both ways he so parshuram's power is illustrated according to both ways <clears throat> so he has already exhibited power in terms of first fighting and overpowering a vicious kshatriya then he has exhibited his power in self control when his father tells him to give in goes goes tells him to do atonement he does atonement then when his father is angry he expertly deals with his father's anger so in this way he is exhibiting various abilities he is exhibiting various abilities yesterday i discussed about the virtues of a shauryam tejo dhruti daksham yuddhe chaapya palayanam दानम ईश्वर भाव से शास्त्र कर्म स्वभाव सो वन ऑफ द इज शौर्य तेजो धुति दाक्षम दाक्षम इज एक्सपर्टीज और रिसोर्सफुलनेस सो हियर परशुराम रिसोर्सफुलनेस इज बीइंग हाईलाइटेड इज बीइंग हाईलाइटेड इन दिस वे सो इन जनरल इफ अ पर्सन गेट्स एंग्री एंड डज समथिंग वायलेंट वी हैव टू सी व्हाट हैपन बिफोर दैट what provoked that violence and then we can move forward actually to look at the violence in a broader context so now let's move on to what happens later on in this chapter i won't go verse by verse but the broad story line is so so in the jaydev goswami song he basically says he he purifies the earth of all the uh, the vicious kings so it's not just a violent campaign it's a cleansing campaign nowadays we have the word of detox the body cleanse the body take these fluids or stop taking this food so if we consider the social body hmm, if it gets infected social body then it needs to be cleansed so what happens over here is and the the whole i won't go into the details of the story but what he finds is that first his his father offers very warm hospitality to the king so a sage offers hospitality to the king 
And instead of that, if you look at the broad storyline, his father, Sage, receives a king generously. This is Kartavir Arjuna. But the king, instead of thanking him for the reception, demands that you give the cow. The king steals or we could say abducts, forcibly takes away, forcibly takes away the sage's cow. Now the sage doesn't want the cow only for his own, other uh, only for his own pleasure. He wants it to perform religious activities, performing dharma. And when this happens, at that time, Parshuram goes and he feels that this king, the kings are meant to protect the sages. But he is stealing from a sage. This is outrageous. So he goes and asks him for to give the cow back. When he refuses, then at that time they have a fight. And Parshuram kills the king. So this is all that happened in the last chapter. Hmm? Parshuram kills the ka king. So at this time, there has been a serious violation of Kshatriya Dharma by the king. Instead of protecting a Brahmana, he's stealing from a Brahmana. And for that, he is punished. And you know, why is this such a serious thing? Because if a king can do like this to a Brahmana, then they can do like this to anyone. Because in one sense, the kings had great power over there. And their power, if it was not, it didn't have sufficient checks and balances, then it could be abused. And one way to prevent the abuse was that. <clears throat> so generally, when does power get abused? So abuse of power usually happens when there is no accountability. That means if I feel I am the top person over here and nobody can hold me to account, nobody can make me get pay, pay, make me pay consequences for what I have done, then people abuse the power. If they know there are going to be consequences, then, then they will not do that. So, so the kings, so generally the Kshatriyas were regulated by the Brahmanas. They were supposed to be guided by the Brahmanas. And the Kshatriyas abused their power against Shudras, against Vaishyas, against other members of society. And the Brahmanas would regulate them. But if the Kshatriyas, regu instead of listening to their those who are meant to regulate them, attack and kill those very regulators itself, then that's a horrendous thing to do. That's a horrendous thing to do. So it's almost like, say, it's uh, the police, uh, the police, uh, they go on a killing rampage and the police kill civilians. And when, now this is a very proximate example, but just to relate this with our society, and when they are to be judged and then kill the judge, judges who may sentence them. And what's happening is, and that's outrageous. If the, it's, they kill civilians is bad enough, but they kill the judges. That means the police just want to take over all power for themselves. That would be outrageous. So the judges are not exactly like Brahmanas, but if you consider that in today's system, the judiciary, is meant to balance the executive and the legislature. So the, the system of check and balance of power has to be there. In the past, the Kshatriyas and Brahmanas were the check and balance. Now in today's world, we have we don't exactly have the Kshatriya, Kshatriyas thing, Kshatriya thing like that. But checks and balances are important. So if once is one system, if one you could say one center of power abuses Kshatriyas and, balance, Kshatriyas and Brahmanas, they balanced each other in the past. Uh, <clears throat> and today's world, we may have the, as we said, three wings. There is the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. They balance each other. But if one goes about just eliminating the other, then that would be a disaster. So that is what is happening over here. So when Parashuram goes and kills the king, that is not just but if there's no balance of power, the king is ready to threaten and rob from a Kshatriya. So Parashuram goes and kills him, punishes him for that. It is basically, to, now it's significant at that time, Parashuram, so Parashuram's killing of the king was to simply restore the balance of power. 
so at this point he did not try to take over the kingdom he did not kill the king's sons he did not do anything more the king was the wrong doer the king got the punishment but then what happened after that was so it was simply to restore the balance of power but after that the king's sons came kartavir arjuna's sons okay i'm just using the simpler name of king arjuna and king's sons so they were worse than their father their father had robbed from a sage but here they killed the sage so now this is even worse now when parshuram was not there at that time the sun killed jamadagni and at that time when he saw that he had been killed at that time he decided that this it's uh, the rot runs throughout the system so when the sons rather than rectifying what their father had done the sons did worse than the father so that that time parshuram's conclusion was the you can say the rot runs throughout the system and then what has to be done the system itself has to be knocked over has to be knocked over and that is what parshuram does next so it is generally you know you can have change in different ways broadly speaking we can have reformation versus revolution reformation is basically gradual incremental change you know okay fix this say for example if you have a house it's a old house which is not a, a very functional okay you know maybe so change the change the roof over here a little bit change the change the roof change the painting change the decor change the color change the decor like that that is all this is a part of reformation but if somebody feel this house is so rickety it is so decrepit just blow up the house and rebuild it use a bomb to detonate and then rebuild it so that is revolution so when parshuram saw the corruption of the kings to the extent that they were not only ready to rob a brahmana sage but even kill the sage at that time he decided it is a time for a revolution the time for a revolution so now again when we talk about um, numbers so when there is violence so if you see this particular context so time and time again i'll, I'll make two more points before I end the class and then we can have some time for questions i was told we should keep some time hopefully i can keep it little time at least so first point over here is that there is a it is said that he killed kshatriyas for 21 generations now we have to know when something is to be taken literally as for the numbers and when something is when some when something is to be the essential principle or literal number so is it that parshuram was sitting waiting oh, which is the first generation second generation third generation fourth generation he had a timer 21 generations i'm going to go and kill well it's not literally like that you could go we could go and argue that is it that he waited if he is going to say if he if he kill kings in one generation then who was there to beget the next generation or was he like so sadistic that he let the king beget a child and only when the king had a male child after that he killed the king and then he let the male child grow up enough to again have another male child and then he killed that king you know was he that cold blooded and calculative like that no it is it doesn't make sense then that sense the principle is that he cleansed kshatriya rudhira that he cleansed the corrupt elements in the he cleansed or removed neutralized whatever what you want to use, cleanse the corrupt elements in the administration so that is the essential principle now how exactly it happened was it literally 21 generations maybe maybe not the point is not that it was he was brutally waiting that in 21 generations everything will get cleansed and i will keep a counter and every single person from 21 generations will be killed no 21 generations here it conveys it could be literal it could not be literal but the, i'm not saying it is not literal i'm not saying it is literal 
I'm saying is the essential principle. What does Krishna come from? What does Krishna descend for in this world? He descends to Vinashaya Chadushkritam. In 4.8 he says that he comes to destroy the demoniac. That is one of the purposes of his descent. This is BG 4.8. And that is what is depicted over here. That Parashuram did a thorough job of removing the correct elements from the Kshatriya dynasty. And thus, he restored dharma. He re-established order. Uh, and so re-establish dharma or the, so, you can say, which is uh, social, moral and spiritual order in society. So this is also in 4.8 itself, both of them. So this is, so the point is, let's look at the principle over here. And I mentioned one more point, which could be a whole big subject, but I won't go into the whole subject. But principle, see, whenever in today's world, there is a big fear about religious violence and holy wars that there are people who kill others in the name of religion, in the name of their faith. It's significant over here. If we look at this war, this war and Parashuram's campaign against the king, it was, uh, it was violence against wrongdoers not non-believers. It's a very significant statement that it's a, and it's a very significant point actually. He was not killing the Kshatriyas because they were not ready to worship the Supreme Lord or something like that. It is because they were disrupting social order. It is because they were abusing power. Because they were abusing power, so they were killed. So in general, if we consider broadly speaking, the epics are filled with violence. The Ramayana, uh, there is violence in it. The Mahabharata, in fact, both the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, their center is, our center or climax is, climax is a violent war. But the point is, the war is not fought, it's not fought to establish faith or religion in the, con in the contemporary sense of the word. It is not that one king fights against another king that I'll destroy you unless you become uh, you worship the same God that I am worshiping. It's not like that. If the cli if climax is in, is in a violent war. But if you consider the Mahabharat, in the Mahabharat, it is not that they're all Vaishnavas on one side and people of other denominations from other sides. No. If you see Bhishma was a Vaishnava and he was fighting on the Kaurava, Kaurava side. Similarly, Shantanu, Actually, Bhurishrava rather, Bhurishrava was a Vaishnava and he was also fighting on the Buri. So he was also a Vaishnava and they were fighting on the Kaurava side. On the other hand, we consider Drupada. Drupada was a Shaivite. He was a worshipper of Lord Shiva and he was fighting on the Pandava side. So it was more of if you consider the war that is described in the Vedic scriptures, it is not a war primarily to convert or destroy those who refuse to convert. It is a more a, it is a war which is more of a law and order war rather than a religious war. So we could say epic, this is the last point, epic wars, they are fought not to impose one's faith on others or to destroy those who don't uh, follow that faith, but to establish order in society. And this order is not just like, wow, my God, or you go to hell. It's not like that. Order means there's virtues. So for virtues have to be established in society. People have to live in a law abiding way. So the, the wars that are fought in the epics, they're very, very different from the wars that are fought in the name of religion or the violence that is done in the name of religion today. It's that significant difference is there and that we need to understand. Otherwise, you start thinking, is this like indiscriminate violence against everyone? No, it is not indiscriminate violence. It is discerning use of violence. So not indiscriminate violence. No. If you consider terrorism, it is actually an act only on, attack only on civilians. And that is, that is terrible, but it's a discerning use of violence for for punishing those who are irreformable, for punishing those 
who cannot be a part of an orderly society, who refuse to be, who refuse to reform themselves against incorrigible wrongdoers. So that is, so the wars described in the Vedic context are more for establishing law and order. They are uh, a virtuous order, of course, but still law and order. They are not fought to impose one faith on others. In that sense, they are not the wars which are associated with religion in today's context. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. Broadly, I discussed three main points. The first point was that when we talk about Parshuram's, uh, Parshuram's uh, following his father's instruction to kill his mother and his brothers, now, was it, it is not indicated to indicate how short-tempered his father was or how brutal people were at that time or how vicious was the punishment for even mental adultery. No, the point of this whole pastime is to illustrate Parshuram's presence of mind. He was not indiscriminately violent. He was a Kshatriya who was ready to fight, who had the ability to, he, he was acting in the mood of a Kshatriya, although he's born in Brahmana family. He could fight, he could, could fight fearlessly, but he was also Daksham, he was resourceful to fix things when they started going terribly wrong. And that's what he did with respect to his father. When he got it, when he got all of his family to be revived. And when such a resourceful uh, person engaged in violence, why did he do that? Because he saw that the rot, the rot had pervaded throughout society. And through, so we, the Kshatriyas need to have their power balanced by the Brahmanas. But when the Brahmanas, when the, when the Kshatriyas start killing the Brahmanas itself, or attacking and robbing from the Brahmanas itself, that becomes dangerous. So strong action was required. And that strong action was required against Kartivira Arjuna. And when his sons did worse than him, then strong action was required against them also. And the principle of 21 generations is that he ensured that the power hungry, abusive Kshatriyas were eliminated. And then last point, it is, it is this kind of violence in sacred books might seem disturbing for us because we may associate with terrorism and extremist violence in today's world. But this is not violence to impose one's faith on others. This is actually, uh, this is actually a war fought to punish wrongdoers, pun those who are otherwise incorrigible. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, yeah. Sorry, I went a little over time, but I just wanted to complete these points. Thank you very much, Tanya Charan Prabhu, for your thorough presentation. Very practical. Yeah, Athena has her hand raised. Athena, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, Dandapat Pranams. Yeah. Such a wonderful cl uh, class. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, they're somewhat related. Um, so uh, perhaps bring it back to, um, I guess we'll go chronologically, um, especially as you review too. Um, in your last point, you mentioned that, well, the point of the story is not to say, well, Jamanagdi had a lapse and he was angry and he wanted to kill his wife. Even it was the presence of mind, uh, Parshram. Um, but I was, and I'm sure others are, are thinking this too, but could you address the fact that, um, let's take a, a couple of things. Um, Jamadani is supposed to be, as you said, he reached Samadhi. That means self-realization. That's a very, very, very high level. Um, so you would assume that he's controlled his senses, he's controlled his anger. And while you said that um, the Bhagavatam is great in showing kind of the, um, not the, the transgressions of the characters, um, it, this, if we even take it to present day, uh, in justice system, an act of passion is, um, I mean, that's a huge, I mean, murder for something so small. It's not that she committed adultery, but just even thought of just another man and just let it go. I mean, that would never be okay um, in today's, even today's society, as degraded as it is. Um, that That's the first one. And then somewhat related is, it's interesting if you could comment on the concept of, um, you know, even today we say we must perfect our lives and this concept of being perfect. Um, it's impossible for anyone to actually be perfect. Only God is perfect. So when one perfects one's life, I would have to assume it's complete absorption. And it doesn't mean that one doesn't make mistakes. 
um, and, and you gave the nice example of Hanuman, um, hypothetically saying that to the squirrel, the spider, the spider, um, but even John Monogny, in, in in having such a severe reaction to something we would say in today's context so small and would be incredibly heinous to do, um, it doesn't the the consequence does not equate to the action. Um, so Ooh, it's it's this. Yeah, um, so it, it's I'm, I've just been contemplating this mm. this idea of what it means to really perfect one's life, um, because and I don't want to go too long because you can I could give a lot of examples, but even the Pandavas who are perfect devotees and perfect perfected beings right bima didn't have his senses in one sense controlled um and they they have a lot of kshatriya kind of say anger in in and um okay. and their stories in the ba uh, mahabharat but i'm um, sorry i i have a couple more questions of that but i love yeah, let, let, you let, I you know. yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah thank you i appreciate your point it's an important question overall so we if we see the amount of anger that Jamada Agni is exhibiting, uh, it, it seems to be utterly disproportionate to the crime. And uh, in that context, what does attaining perfection mean? Okay. So two things. First of all, it is very important to, there are certain things in scripture, which are the teaching of scripture and certain things which are descriptions in scripture. Hmm. And not everything which is a description in scripture is a teaching of scripture. Hmm. So for example, in the seventh canto, Hiranyaksha tells Hiranyakashipu that, sorry, Hiran, Hiranyakashipu tells his followers that actually if you, hmm, what is the word? That if you stop all the yajnas, if you destroy all the brahmanas, then what will happen is, then this whole, uh, then the devtas will become will really starved, and the devtas will be uh, the devtas will die, and then eventually Vishnu will become weak, and Vishnu will also die. Now this is a statement in scripture. This is a whole different presentation, but quick point that everything in scripture it is not necessarily teaching of scripture who is speaking and when they are speaking that is very very important to understand so i can give many examples like i give this example of Yag vishnu or uh, will kill vishnu by stopping yagya that is hiranyakashipu statements and now i'll just take one other example even krishna speaks to the Vrajavasis, that there's no need for you to worship indra or any devtas you just do your kshatriya or kshatriya duty and that's good enough now, that is not the vedantic teaching that is not the vaishnav teaching it's so even the absolute truth may not always speak the absolute truth. Krishna is the absolute truth, but he's not always speaking the absolute truth. So, <clears throat> so if the word spoken by the absolute truth may not be the absolute truth, then what to speak of words spoken by finite living beings? So who are subjected to frustrating experiences and they may do something or speak something at particular times. So when certain sages insist on doing certain things or they do certain things in a spate of anger, was that the normative behavior of the sages? Was that a standard behavior that was recommended? Uh, no, not at all. So that, so that what somebody does in anger, that is not necessarily the norm at all. That's one important point to understand that everything in scripture is not the teaching of scripture. So now, how does he do that? How does he get angry? Well, in general, there is a tendency that if we are pure, then sometimes our purity may, if we have gone through a lot of struggle in maintaining our purity, then we are empathic with others who are struggling to maintain purity. But if we have attained purity, then another result could be that those who do not show purity, there could be a lot of uh, lot of intolerance and uh, one result of purity could be compassionate assisting everyone else to become pure. But another effect of purity could be intolerance of any kind toward impurity. And wherever say, impurity is seen, there is a vehemently aggressive reaction to it. So that is also possible. Now that is not necessarily a desirable thing. Uh, and unfortunately, you can say in some ways, the caste system in India, 
was a result of this kind of uh, intolerance toward uh, you could say intolerance toward certain conventional conceptions of purity uh, conventional conceptions of impurity so if a person from a lower caste would drink water from a well of a well that was meant for people for higher castes and this happened right up to the 1920s 1930s in india that that person would be beaten up how dare you pollute our water like this so even that person would just be even if a small child would be doing that so there is there is that intolerance towards impurity which can which can be good if it helps one to become pure but it can also lead to uh, undesirable consequences when it uh, an undesirable or unrealistic level of aggressiveness toward those who do not exhibit that level of purity so that is my understanding over here time and time again the sages sometimes because they follow certain standards and they expect others to follow those standards then so uh, what happen uh, then we they may sometimes uh, went out against others so unfortunately this particular issue becomes a little more polarizing because we can relate with the issue we live in a world where you no know, there is uh, uh, there is significant amount of uh, awareness of say uh, male abuse of power against females and in that sense a, a sage uh, taking such aggressive action against his wife for some mental indiscretion you no know, so which frame if we put this in the feminist frame this may seem outrageous but instead of putting it in the feminist frame if we put it in the in the frame in which bhagavatam is putting it the bhagavatam time and time is showing us the the it is not showing it in charitable terms it is not saying in laudatory terms it is not saying that there is nowhere the description that what jamadagni did it was great and glorious see time and time again the bhagavatam shows how brahmanas misuse their power how right the starting from the bhagavatam is shringi cursing parikshit maharaj in this very canto um, we have ambarish maharaj being cursed by durvasa muni so so we could say that at one level what is parikshit maharaj being assured that he's shown that time across history there have been different sages who have misused their power and shri it in one sense through by telling so many stories of sages misusing their powers Uh, the, and especially a lot of such stories come in the ninth canto so why is that that it is to assure uh, parikshit maharaj that don't feel too bad about yourself don't think that you alone are the victim of these things the sages have abused powers in the past and that is horrible but move on in your life now you have opportunity to focus on krishna focus on krishna and he will work everything all right so i would say that is the thrust there otherwise if you just read objective uh, read ob, read even from a contemporary moral lens many of the actions of the sages in the ninth canto can seem very very disturbing so the point of that description in the broader context of the bhagavatam is to remove any sense of resentment or remorsefulness or not remorsefulness any res- any residual resentment or looking back oh, why did this have to happen to me no it is not, it is unfair but you know life is unfair there are many people who get victimized by unfairness so if you put it in the feminist lens it just becomes outrageous but but if we see if it is of putting it in those lens we put it in the lens of abuse of power by brahmanas well it's a sign of kaliyuga that this happens and although this particular incident might not be in kaliyuga now you know the bhagavatam is speaking from from it's drawing from even different millennia from different yugas from different uh, days of brahma also its stories so if we consider over the of the millions and billions and trillions of years there the bhagavatam is drawing incidents which involve kshatriya brahmanas using misusing their power at times to highlight this point the parikshit maharaj you are not alone in being in having the old in being targeted by such misuse of power but still move on move on so that is my understanding and perfection is what perfection is not necessarily never committing a mistake perfection is not letting the mistake define us not letting the letting that mistake be repeated till it becomes a part of us so in general as you said the pandavas yudhishthir gambles 
So there are there is a time in the Ramayana also the Ram is described to the ideal character, but Ram gets angry at the devas when Sita is abducted and he says that, no, you tell me where is Sita and help me to get her back. Otherwise, you are supposed to be the witnesses. If you are not witnessing and you are not bearing witness and not telling me, I will destroy the whole universe. And at that time, Lakshman has to calm Ram down. And he says, my dear brother, if everybody started getting angry and destroying things, when bad things happen to them, how would the world's order be maintained? You have to demonstrate, demonstrate fortitude at the time of this adversity. And then Ram looks at Lakshman and he says, he says, yes, what you're saying is true. Thank you for reminding me. And then Lakshman says, actually, I'm simply a mirror. The words that you have spoken to me, guiding me to control my anger, I'm simply repeating those words to you. So Lord Ram, is he imperfect? He's a supreme Lord. He's not imperfect. But he's playing the role of a human being. And he says, as a human being, he's showing how even he can, life can be so distressing that even he can be subjected to anger. But to his credit is that he doesn't simply act on the anger. When he feels angry, when he's given good advice, when his brother gives him good advice, he immediately listens to it. And he he doesn't get into anger. So, so perfection would mean that not that a person may not make a misjudgment at times, but they don't perpetuate that or aggravate or exacerbate that misjudgment. As soon as they come, in one sense, not only did they, they correct themselves as soon as they uh, understand it, but they also have, we could say, social supports, relationships, and other things which make them aware of their mistakes immediately. So that's so perfection is it's not like a one state we attain and after that there is it could be for some people that they attain a state by which they will never fall back but if you look at the overall trajectory it is that they may have some lapses but they are they correct themselves after the lapses and we move on till we attain ultimate perfection in the material world there is no the everybody is under the is is potentially under the power of illusion everybody can be tempted and that's why we need to be vigilant ourselves and we need to have a support system that can help us to be vigilant also. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Yes. Hope that answers your question. Hare Krishna. Thank you.